explain that. But now let's move into our webinar with Laura and Gotti and hear more about what she can tell us about on needs. Now, Laura, as you know, I am new to needs, uh, but in the short time that I've been studying them, and actually yeah, I see Chris Fry there in the audience. He's one that I've been talking to. And Chris says, along with a lot of other folks, and I won't name any other names, that modern yeast nutrients and extensive aging are essential for good mead. What do you think of that? Well, first of all, I want to say that the historical record does not support the idea that any of the people in the history I study, which is before 1750, so I can't speak to after that, there's no indication that any of them thought raisins were any good as nutrients. Sorry, I don't know where that myth came from, but it was after the period I study. Um, so I'm, not, I'm gonna have to disagree with that because there are, I've had so many meads made from recipes that when you do them historically, they do not use, they do not use nutrients in the way we think. There's a lot of evidence that they were using a number of procedures that would have effectively provided things that function as yeast nutrients. And we can talk about that a little bit later. But long aging, you can argue that these people didn't know what they were doing, but their goals were almost certainly exactly the same as ours. They wanted something to drink, they wanted something that was tasty, and they wanted it to have flavors that, additional flavors that they liked. They wouldn't have been drinking things after a few weeks or a few months if they really thought the flavor was vastly inferior. We do see a number of recipes that say the longer you can keep them, the better, or age it seven years and longer if you can. But it's all balance. It's balance and it's art. So I think you can get fantastic meads in any number of a huge different number of different ways. Without and, nutrients mm -hmm. or, or not without, I guess, uh, the nutrients you buy from the store. There's no question that adding nutrients, I'm, I'm an engineer. I've worked in fermentation. I've worked in industrial fermentation. Nutrients make yeast happier. Happier yeast behave in a more predictable and a, they produce fewer side products of metabolism. These are, in general, good ways to make your fermentation run smoothly and predictably. But they're not the only story. And, you know, and in fact, to challenge this, I'll, I'll, I'll bring up the, um, the current trend in beers, which you're probably very familiar with, of funky beers, funky fermentations. Oh, yeah. Actually purposefully introducing things that do unpredicted, unexpected things. Wouldn't we call that the same when yeast are stressed and produces those byproducts of, of, of fermentation, the byproducts of metabolism? Aren't those analogous in the same ways? And yet you don't see the beer world getting all up in arms and saying, oh, these are horrible beers. So I think there's certainly like many things having to do with brewing. There's always a huge personal preference, what you're comfortable with, what works best for you for brewing. Uh, we long known that you can give the same recipe to six different people, say, go make this, even with detailed instructions, and will you get six completely tasting, different tasting brews? Of course you will. So uh, to me, it's all a balance of things that make a huge difference, things that may or may not make a huge difference, and things that are a matter of preference and taste. Okay. But that's a view from a historical brewer, not someone who's assertively modern in everything I do. So, so our, our mead, uh, uh -huh. to keep with our commercial calibration, you yep. chose the Viking blood. So do you think this had yeast nutrients? Oh, I'm sure that they did because the requirements that are placed on you by producing a commercial product are numerous and c consistency and reproducibility are probably chief among those. Yeah. And if you want your process to be reproducible and consistent, 
you control every single variable that you can. Sure. That's going to mean you use things like yeast nutrients because they help clamp down on uncertainty. Yeah. The difference between the home brewer versus the commercial. Or there's a most, I'm not sure I'd say that because I think a lot of home brewers, especially ones that are using the same recipe again and again, try very hard to clamp down on that uncertainty. So they're getting a similar result. Well, this is going to be really cool. I can't wait to do it. So yeah. do we want to get into our commercial calibration? So I the reason I chose this was because one, it says on the bottle that it was based on a historical recipe, which is, is kind of nice. And two, because it's unusual, it, 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 like, unlike many modern meads, it includes ingredients from at least three different class of classifications of additive. We have the hibiscus flowers, which are added for color, which is a historical practice, uh, saffron, um, clove gilliflowers, which are a kind of carnation, and marigolds, as well as wine have all been used historically to add color to mead. It contains hops, which are a relatively common addition to historical meads and are actually long associated with northern meads with, in keeping with the, the Viking uh, name. And it also contains, they're not clear on it. They say spices and also mention ginger on their website. So we know that it has at least those flavors in it. So at the risk of being a little bit generic, we have a spice, a flower, and a, another flower of hops, but we can treat those, we can think of those sort of as an herb. It does have another thing that is not particularly historical, which is it's a fortified mead. Uh, alcohol has been, uh, spirits have been added to increase the alcohol. This is about 19%. So certainly it's similar to port in that, and there's really no analogy to port in the periods that I, I cover. So if we look at this, we see some color from the hibiscus, but not the brighter red that we often see with hibiscus meads. We have a, you can get some hops in the nose, And it's a relatively sweet mead, and it has that um, volatility on the tongue that I associate with port. So not to get sidelined too much into an in-depth discussion of this mead, I was interested today looking at what it says on the back of the bottle, which becomes, to me, is actually more interesting. It talks about the appearance of mentions of mead in the 4,000 year old uh, Indian, subcontinent, uh, Indian subcontinent Veda books, which is true. It says the recipe that this is based on is from about circa 1700. And that's certainly more than plausible in terms of hops and ginger and other spices. It's a little less likely in terms of the hibiscus flower. I haven't seen hibiscus flower mentioned in any of the meads that I've cataloged up to uh, 1750. And I suspect they are probably substituting those as a modern coloring agent for a more historical coloring agent or for some other reason. What's interesting to me is that they speak of uh, Oleus Magnus who wrote a book called uh, History of the Northern People uh, which they date to 1520, which is interesting because as far as I'm aware, the book was first published in 1555. And although it does mention some events that took place in 1520, it doesn't itself that either the text or the recipes for me that are in it date to 1520. Um, but one of the other interesting things about the Oleus Magnus books is it mentions a mead that is made in Ethiopia and therefore is one of the early mentions of Tej, which is, um, I think most mead makers are familiar with. And, and repeat that again, I'm gonna change the camera back. Sure. That, what was that ingredient you just mentioned? The um, 
Tej, which is an Ethiopian mead, is most frequently made with gesho, which is a, um, a bark, and it's a, a flavorant. Uh, that is one of the historical meads that I have not made. Actually, believe it or not, uh, mead, Ethiopian mead is mentioned in by some Greek and Roman era writers. So this makes Tej one of the really well, relatively well documented historical meads out there. We have a pretty solid history for it going back about 2000 years. And you're pronouncing that Tej? That's how I pronounce it. Uh, I, my pronunciation can be variable. I learn words from reading them yeah. in these texts and I may or may not be, uh, I, I may or may not be responsible for proper pronunciation. Well, and, or and I can't I'll, be held responsible. And I'll put a little Southern twang on it anyway. So, <laughs> so what did it, what does Tej taste like? I mean, as compared to the Viking blood. I haven't had Tej. I don't know. I, I, um, you can actually get Gesho fairly readily and, um, making, um, making a batch of Tej by what I can, Determine is it best I determine for a historical recipe is on the books for my next book, not the one I'm working on right now. But the book I'm working on right now is a collection of 17th and 18th century meads from English household manuscripts, which were a feature of middle and upper class households in, the, in that period where they collected, you know, it's, it's like you have those do you have those cards in your kitchen with Aunt Sadie's muffin recipe? Oh, and no. these books were exactly that in, this, in that period where they would collect cooking and medical recipes, what to do. Uh, remedies against the bite of a mad dog were popular. Um, some of them were snail water was common. That one, I'm not sure sounds very appealing, but a lot of these books contain recipes for meats. So I cl I've collected about a, a little over a uh, over a hundred of them, and they're all from manuscripts held by uh, the Wellcome Library in London. And I've put them together with some historical background and a first pass at all the recipes. And I'm hoping to publish that in the next month, ready for the end of the year. So the recipe, the recipes for mead are mixed in with the recipes for biscuits and all the they other can be. Well, this is one of the very interesting things about historical mead recipes is the vast majority of them appear in places that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Yes, there are books on brewing, uh, particularly the Germans were fond of producing brewing books in the 16th and 17th century. But there's not very many of books that are that specific. There's books on cookery, and a few of them contain mead recipes. We also see mead recipes in books on both. Now, this is a very interesting. We see them in books on housewifery, which is the indoors activities. We also see them in books on husbandry, which are the outdoor farming activities. Mm -hmm. A really interesting crossover status for mead between the indoor women's world and the outdoor men's world. Now, of course, those are generalizations, but... We also see recipes for meads in travelogues. I went here and they served me this and it was made in this way. That's a source of actually most of the English language information we have on Russian meads. So I got to ask this question. I know mm -hmm. historically for beer, yep. uh, a couple of hundred years ago, it was mostly the, the woman of the house, so to speak, who, yep. brew, who was the brewer. Now, yep. what about me? Is that true too? I suspect it was probably very true in the yeah. same way um, that even though the those recipes may have appeared in the husbandry books, it was more a function of this was a outdoor activity that was not done in the kitchen as opposed to this being purely a male oriented activity. And so we call those husbandry books, which has the male connotation, but it's not it's never absolute. So the mead was not brewed in the kitchen? It could be. We see that because we see though we see recipes in cookbooks, which is definitely a clear association that was done in the kitchen. We also see batches sizes for mead that range from under a gallon. Those are often medicinal in nature, so short term and probably used in smaller amounts. And those, by the way, would appear in 
medical books or books or meat recipes that appear in herbals, books that are about the plants and the herbs and the properties of those herbs, where they say, make a mead with this and the properties of that will cure this. And so, and I've backtracked on your question. So you were asking about the, so the batch sizes, we also see batch sizes for mead that are in the couple of hundred gallons. Those would almost certainly have been made using that same equipment that was used for beer making. Yeah, I would think so. I think it would have to be. Yeah, although those one and two gallon batches would have been done in a stew pot or a cook pot in the kitchen. Well, it so, almost sounds like those small batches were almost like a, what do they call it, a tincture that, that the physicians or the pharmacists would make for administering? Well, we, we do see some recipes that have clear medicinal intent. Yeah. And those would be made some medicine. like other meads, but the additives that are put into them would be intended to have a, a physical effect. In fact, the, the very famous Boucher recipe, which was written in 1393 in a Parisian uh, advice book written to a young wife on how to run the household, that recipe for Boucher, which is very famous now, and I think Every, almost every mead maker in existence has given their a try to their version of it. That recipe appears in the section of that manual that is for the sick house. Suggest the sick, the sick house? Sick, sick house. Yeah. These things to do when someone in the household is sick. Oh. Suggesting that it very, very well may have been viewed as a recipe that had healing properties. That somehow that that caramelization of the honey may have been uh, intended as a medicinal effect. So if it didn't cure them, they were at least a lot happier. Uh, well, he, the alcohol always helps. <laughs> um, well, not now, always. I, I now, shouldn't be, I shouldn't be too, uh, yeah, um, so, so this is what, almost 20%. This is almost 20%. So what would those have been? I mean, this has been fortified. Uh, what do you think those old recipes would get it up? I think those old recipes range. Well, when I've, when I've, I've done the, so you know, here we go. This is pretty much straight from what I talked about at HomebrewCon. The variety of historical meads. Expected OGs of the meads that I've calculated one for, which is a sub, very small subset, because it, it takes a lot to actually calculate. You have to think about the boil, whatever they've done to it, range from 1.035 to 1.23. So in other words, that's a potential alcohol of maybe three to four percent to well beyond, well, well beyond the um, expectancy of, of most yeast. So I think yeast uh, meads historically range in alcohol from probably three or four percent to realistically thirteen percent plus or minus. We, one of the things that we do not know, and and this is something that it's it's uh, people might, some people will find it disappointing, some people will find it uh, encouraging. If you have a, a yeast culture that you're using actively. It reproduces every hour and a half to two hours. So if you're carrying that culture from batch to batch across a year and, and brewing fairly regularly, it's not at all unlikely that you could be getting a thousand generations of yeast from your culture in a year. So we, our yeasts today are separated from those historical yeast by potentially hundreds of thousands of generations of yeast. To put that in a term that may resonate a little bit better, that's more generations than between Homo sapiens and Neanderthal. Hmm. Now, there's amazing work being done on yeast. 20 years ago, in 1997, a paper was published that talked about the complete genome sequencing of one variety of Saccharomyces cerevisia. That was a huge task at the time. A couple of years ago, 2017, exactly 20 years later, a paper was published that compared the complete genomes of over 1,000 species of Saccharomyces cerevisia. Earlier this year, some archeologists in Israel published a paper that resulted that 
uh, talk about the results of extracting yeast from pottery, cultivating it, using it to make beer, and then tasting the beer. Out of the seven, I think they tried seven yeasts, and they determined that three of them tasted pretty good. One tasted um, not great, but okay. Okay? Want to know what's the real joke here? Of those four species of yeast, only one was Saccharomyces cerevisia, hmm. the that we overwhelmingly use today to produce alcohol with. Yeah. Now, none of those yeasts are available commercially. So now we're sort of stuck betwixt and between. We know that there's this huge evolutionary gap between the yeasts we have today and the yeasts that could have been used 300 years ago. We know that alcohol and CO2 are still their major byproducts of metabolism. But do we have any reason to believe that we have any clue how they behave to temperature changes, what they did under stress, or how they... So my feeling is right now, we can't say anything. Use whatever yeast you want. It's as likely to be historically accurate. Even something like the Kviek yeasts that are becoming very popular now, they've got 100 or more years of active yeast use, and we don't know how they've changed and adapted in that time. So do you have an opinion on, I mean, would these have stalled out? I mean, if... if no, I, I suspect that... You think they could have gotten a 13% meat? I, I suspect they probably did get to, to 12 or 13%. And, and the reason why we can be pretty sure of that is, again, compare it to wines. We know that the sugar, the sugar in grape juice when you press it is relatively constant. Mm -hmm. And we don't see them talking about the flavor of wine in a significantly different way than we do today. So there's really no reason to believe that wines were on the whole significantly sweeter. So therefore, we can believe that yeasts on the whole fermented wines about the same as they do now, which would mean that we're in that 11 to 13 percent range. And, it's and, speculative. And wine yeasts are commonly used, aren't they? Wine yeasts are commonly used. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, there was a paper I was reading earlier this year that was using some. Now, mind you, I have a degree in biology, but it was a while ago. Using some very fancy comparative that established the split between German, British, and American beer yeasts was between 1584 and 1614. Like, okay. That's kind of precise for 400 years ago. Um, but this is the sort of worst that's being done now. And I do believe that in four or five years, we will have, someone will have gone back, found a container, extracted the yeast out of the pores into that, in that clay, cultivated it, and we're, we're going to be able to use yeasts that were 400, 500, 2,000 years old. And we'll have a much better basis. But today, we're in the middle of that uh, exploration and discovery, which is pretty amazing. So you're going to touch back on the nutrients question. Uh, okay. So what we see well, is... I've just heard it stressed so much, and I haven't brewed my first batch yet, but I want to. But, but honey is expensive. I mean, you get pretty good investment in a batch, so... Honey, honey can be very expensive, and I make yeah. make a mead from a seventeen hundred year old recipe um, that is pomegranate juice and honey and nothing else. And yeah, by the time you make a gallon of that, you're 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 in it for 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 a fair amount. Um, but it's really tasty. So this is. My belief as a historical brewer is that you can make really, really good mead without using yeast nutrients. Again, as I say, do they make the process more predictable, a little bit more reliable, and fewer wild cards? Yes. That said, I try to stay agnostic on it. I make my mead in the way that I make it because I have the interest in understanding what people five what people 500 years ago were tasting when they drank their mead yeah because that is my goal i don't tend to use yeast nutrients everyone has to make their choice what are they trying to achieve what do they want to do what 
uncertainties are they willing to tolerate? And they make their mead in a way that suits their needs and their desires. So I don't want to, I, to a certain extent, I, I let myself get it drawn into debate that I don't actually view as particularly yeah. important because the people who want to do that, people who find it important or find it important given the flavors that they're evoking will do that because that's that's necessary for them. It almost sounds like oxygenating your wart. Uh, you know, do you want to use pure oxygen or do you want to, you know, get it other ways? Mm -hmm. it, it, you're not debating whether you have oxygen in the wart or not to, to get it to ferment. It's just, you know, however you get there. So the, yeah. it sounds like the nutrients is very much the same. In, in my opinion, in my opinion, and, and yeah. I would be far from telling anyone that they, that they should make meat exactly the way I do. But I hear yours is quite good. And, and I hope it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, we see it's, couple of comments in there. Chris oh. says, I agree with Laura. If you want to make a historical mead, then the nutrients are out. Heck, if you want to make a historical beer, that's one's thumbs instead of a thermometer. Yeah. <laughs> Go, Chris. <laughs> so I see that Joseph made a couple points that you're adding fruit, you're adding nutrients. And that's actually a good entree into, we do have a number of things that we see added to meads as nutrient analogs. Melomels, uh, meads made with fruits, are actually quite popular in the historical record. In fact, you want to throw up the um, pic uh, picture we have of the my wonderful graft of historical mead styles? Uh, we'll do that in just one moment. Yeah. You keep talking while I pull it up here. So, so this 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 chart is a little bit, as I said earlier, a little bit of uh, arrogance in some way, because it summarizes over a great number of years, a great number of geographies, and a great number of recipes to make some generalizations. But the core generalization to be made here is that needs were very varied. There were trends over time, and we see things change as a result of other things that are going on in history. And when you're looking at historical meads, being able to view them in the light of what else was going on in history actually does become important because nothing exists in a vacuum. Uh, I, I call it the interconnectivity of all things. And I apologize, when I made this bigger, I accidentally, um, disconnected my trend lines from my my figure and did not notice it when I send it. But we can see here I've looked I'm looking at three, four different time rough time periods in this this chart. In each of the sets of colors, the first is recipes that date from before 1600 AD. The second line is recipes from 1600 to 1669. The third line is um, recipes from Sir Kenan Ligeti's The Closet Open, which I think most people are familiar with. It was published in 1669 and remains, as far as I'm aware, to this day, the largest collection of mead recipes ever published. And then the fourth line, which is the darkest in each color, is uh, recipes that date from 1670 to 1750. So what we see here is that for plain meads, the first category, we see fewer recipes for them over time. This might be a reflection of the fact that those earlier recipes are a lot of repetition of Roman and Greek era recipes, which appear multiple times. Uh, these lines do include duplicates, recipes that are entered into my catalog more than once. We see a decrease in melomels over time although it appears to increase at the very end there, which is a false increase because that, that line includes um, meads that are, includes a cu couple of new ingredients as, a, as opposed to um, the decrease in old style melomels. And what we happened there is that in the 17th century, sugar became a very, very inexpensive commodity. And as a result, we saw fruit meads turning into 
fruit wines made with sugar as the additional sweetener rather than honey. Lemon, although citrus was around in culinary use for thousands of years, the first solid recipe I have that uses lemon in a mead is after 1600. And then it explodes onto, onto, into use in meads. Uh, it's a lot of it's lemon peel, I, but it may still have some uh, connection to, this is something that requires some more search, whether there's a acidification issue there as well. You can see that use of spices, herbs, and both herbs and spices does increase over time in meads. So these styles show that within history, things changed over time, unsurprisingly. And if we were to make similar charts based on geographies, we would see some very um, significant. We would see some very significant differences between geographies in what types of meads were most popular. So, Laura, why the popularity of the spice? Were they less expensive? I mean, you'd mentioned the expense of the melomel and the fruit, and then the honey. I think that they were a little bit less expensive, but need was always, honey has always been a high class ingredient. We see it reflected in the use of honey as a tithing uh, in, across the Middle Ages. We see it in the um, association of with it both and also to the church. Honey was a valued commodity. It was also always a limited supply. You can't grow more honey. You can grow more barley. You can grow more grapes, but you can't just say, you, you, to a certain extent, you can't just say acreage produced more honey. It, does, you can't, it doesn't work that way. So honey has always have, had a high perceived value. Mm -hmm. Saying that the spices in particular have had a high perceived value. So use of those two high perceived value items together is probably not surprising at all. The use of herbs in mead is much more of a medical um, process in a lot of cases, although that's not absolutely true. Certainly uh, the most used herb in honey in meads is rosemary. And rosemary was not a herb that has a lot of medical uh, So a lot of medical um, effects associated with it. It was almost certainly used for a flavor purpose rather than uh, as a medical herb. And by the way, rosemary is an awesome addition to mead. The, the piney and the slightly uh, biting side of it is really tasty, uh, in my opinion. Actually, lemon and rosemary, awesome mead. I've made a... Uh, 1660 recipe a couple of times wonderful flavor and the scale you, you've got four bars yep how many centuries are we covering in those four bars well the that? first bar covers about 15 centuries the second bar covers two-thirds of a century the third bar covers one book and the fourth bar covers about three quarters of a century so as i said we're drawing generalities here in a way that is from a, if any, if anyone who's listening does statistics, they're probably, uh, you know, biting their tongue and trying to avoid saying something nasty about misuse of statistics. Um, and I acknowledge that freely because this isn't meant to be a absolute, this is meant to show some trends and to serve as a way to discuss how things, how, what mead looked like and how it might've changed over time. So when we talk about uh, those add, you know, so why don't we move on to talking about all those things that we add to mead? Because speaking of plain mead historically is a little less exciting than it is in the modern day. In the modern day, when we speak of plain mead, we almost always talk about those varietal honeys that lend very specific flavors and intensities to mead. And the concept of varietal honey is a very modern one because historical beekeeping 
required destruction of the hive to collect honey. Therefore, those short-term, those varietal honeybees, which have to be collected within a fair approximation of when that blooming season is, is really only possible with the hives we have today where you can do immediate collection or partial collection without uh, really disturbing the hives, hive significantly. So historical honey is essentially wildflower honey. And those honeys would have varied significantly, spring, fall, forest, field, English versus German versus France versus Russia. So my, my I usually use a, a raw wildflower honey and I take whatever I get when I go up to my apiary and I get my bucket of honey and sometimes I get a very nice light uh, honey that doesn't crystallize readily and I think I got one last year it was very dark and already crystallized when I got it and for me again my goal is trying to figure out what this historical flavor might have been like and that variance in the honey is to me all part and parcel of, of the fun of figuring things out um, which may not be as happy a uh, conclusion for some some of the modern mead makers so when we you're talk not about picking up your honey at Costco uh, I've been known to um, <laughs> but no I I'm very lucky that the uh, what is it Wednesdays and Saturdays like two or three hours a day, I can bop up the road 10 miles and give them a check and they hand me a bucket of honey. And if I'm really lucky, they put it in my car for me, which I can do myself, but I'm certainly not going to object when someone else wants to do it for me. <laughs> but it does make a difference is what I know. I took a class from Chris Fry. Matter of fact, I recorded mm -hmm. it for anybody that's interested. Uh, it's, it's in the set of videos that we have here. Um, but he really stressed, I mean, you needed to get your honey from a, an AP area and, and one you could trust. Mm -hmm. And you see that difference too. I, you know, I, I, I do feel like it's, it's, it's like many, many things in the world. The more something gets processed, well, they're processing it for a reason, which means they're almost certainly trying to control it. And that usually means taking out everything they don't want. So, yes, in general, something that's closer to the source is probably going to be a better bet. I know Michael Fairbrother said in his webinar that he got his from, I believe it's Brazil. He's gotten his that. from a number of, of different places. I think he's gotten some from Africa, some from Brazil. Yeah. Um, He's he's done some meads with uh, some organic honeys. Um, I, I haven't tasted I haven't tasted as many of their uh, plain honey meads as I yeah you can see I've what is what does my glass say? There you go. Oh moonlight! <laughs> You've got one of their glasses. Mine, mine I've got several says, of their glasses. Mine, mine actually says New Belgium, <laughs> but I like it. New Belgium Brewery. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, their 1554 is one of my favorite beers ever. It's my wife's favorite and it's Ugh. the homebrew. I have a I have a recipe. We we digress, but <laughs> I, no. I, I, I have a homebrew uh clone of 1554 they helped me with, and that's her favorite. So uh -huh. anyway, uh yeah, we love New Belgium. They're just right up the road and and right in uh, Chris Chris Fry's backyard. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, we, they, unfortunately, they don't seem to ever, ever uh, really bottle uh, can that now, right? They're almost exclusively cans now, aren't they? I've got about two six packs in the fridge, so I've I've never seen it in a can. But uh, uh, I, well, it I, doesn't I, make it as far as us. It must not. Uh, I'm horribly disappointed. <laughs> well, we'll work on that. Maybe we can get them on a <laughs> webinar to talk about fifteen fifty. Sure. <laughs> but back to me gone far afield multiple times yes from, we have and, uh, and speaking of that laura i like to uh, wrap up the main part of the content yeah. by the top of the hour so we can go to questions sure and i want to encourage everybody it looks like we've got three questions so far 
and Laura okay. will try and yeah. answer all of them. And I know at HomebrewCon, we, you got cut off, didn't you? You didn't get to answer all the questions for people. So I, I know I answered a few questions, but, uh, you know, question and answer is my favorite. Unfortunately, this whole history, you know, as I said, I've got 2,500 recipes in my catalog. We're covering 17 centuries pretty much all of Europe with excursions into Asia and Africa and um, a few other places. This is an enormous topic. And I, I'm starting I'm starting with trying to talk to you about some of this general stuff because one of the things that's really exciting me about this topic is it's not very well explored. And there's a lot of information. You know, if you if you go to Google and you type uh, medieval mead recipe, most of what you're going to get is is gobbledygook and all things like saying, "Oh, I found this great medieval recipe in Digby," and Digby is a perfectly good historical source, but there's no one with much historical knowledge who's going to give much credence to 1669 being medieval. It, that's a miss by about 300 years. Which, looking back from 350 years, 400, almost 400 years later, might seem like not much, but historically, it's huge. So you know, I have Ken Tram's book, but if I wanted to try a, you know, an ancient mead recipe like you have, where would I find it then? The book I'm going to be writing, uh, you can you can go to my website. I actually have a number of recipes on my website that are from much earlier. A good one, so talk about this, which has hops in it. One of the very first historical recipes that I, my husband and I actually, we weren't married yet, but that's okay. We are now. A, which put together and made is a recipe from a German cookbook of about 1350 called Das Buch von Gutterspiece, which has in it a recipe. Um, I think it, the title is, Ein guten Mesmach, which means to make a good mead. And that recipe is fairly sweet and it includes hops and sage. Laura, could I could I get you to share your website and type it in the chat? There? Yeah, it's they pretty easy be folks because interested. it is www mystery of mead. And that's what I go by on Facebook as well. There it is. Good. Yeah. So um who's more on Facebook and post serious things on, on the website. So the recipes there, if I want to, to try yep, one. Yeah, the recipe uh, for um the recipes, uh, all four of the recipes that I serve at uh, Homebrew Con are actually on the website now. And those were for people who weren't there. Uh the first meat I served was meant to be a challenge to all things modern mead making, and it was a mead to which I had pitched the yeast six days before. And the yeast that was pitched in was a 25, a 25 percent addition of a actively prevent fermenting ale wort. OK. Um, yeah. And it sat and I to toddled it down to Providence in a bottling bucket and they served it out of the bottling bucket and it was still fizzing away. Um, and I was actually very pleased with it because it was fizzing. It was actively fermenting. It was cloudy as all heck because it was still completely, every bit of yeast was completely mixed up in it. And um, this is where I say, so we, no nutrients, but, and it was, would people have said this is anything like any mead they'd ever drunk? No. So the second one I served was an example um, that was supposed a spiced mead, which is a very interesting recipe that the first appearance is in a 1570 book that was published. It's a herbal that was published in England, but by a couple of Dutchmen. And that recipe I've now traced the most, the latest appearance I have of that specific recipe with changes, it keeps changing, is almost 250 years later. And it appears here and there. It appears in Germany, in France, in England, 
It appears in a book of alchemy. It appears in a book on husbandry. It appears in books on beekeeping. And it changes little bits and pieces here and there. I, I want to go back to that first one. Gary Fuller says, I am still amazed at how much I liked that first one. So, <laughs> so it was six days old. I mean, it had been fermenting for six days. Zero to six been, days. So so the, the ale must, which was a real cheap... Um, I, I did it really easy. I took yeah. tried malt extract, mixed it up to an OG of about an ale, added in the yeast, that fermented for three days, and then yeah. it was added in as to be 20% of the final of a honey and water mixture, and that sat. And that is taken, made as close as I can to a recipe from the 14th century. So again, about 1350. So both of those, so that recipe is close to 700 years old. So any hot al alcohol in it? I mean, was it? Um, I know. I didn't find it hot alcohol. It went from, let's see, I'm going to have to remember. Well, actually, I'm, I'm going to pull up my spreadsheet because my spreadsheet. Yeah, tells while you're looking, I'll. Uh, I have Fuller a spreadsheet said, for that. So. Gary Fuller said it was clean, malty, sweet, and no yeast bite. So he might have answered my question. That sounds like it was pretty clean. When when I put it when I put it in the uh, bottling bucket to take it down, about thirty six hours before it was served, well, maybe thirty hours before it was served, it had gone from about one point oh nine to about one point oh three. And when I tasted it as it was served, it had lost some additional residual sweetness. Yep. My guess it was probably at about one point oh two which would have been roughly 12% alcohol. Any it, diacetyl? No diacetyl. <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. I mean, one of the things that you get is, is with that type of brew, that, that quick mead, as they would have called it, you get a real yeast, yeast mouth. Okay. And that r will hide a number of the um the, the subtleties yeah yeah so those yeah. those smaller um aromatic and com uh, complex compounds to my mind but here i get a no no we get a nope on the diacetyls yeah <laughs> well we we just finished a webinar on it tuesday so i just had to ask <laughs> <laughs> so the second one i served was a spiced mead which had grains of paradise and long pepper in it, two spices that are not that hard to come by. And I highly recommend for any mead maker to learn them. Long pepper has the bite of pepper with a strong aromatic overlay. It's I've never seen long pepper. What does it look like? If I'm going to. Um, rat turds. <laughs> oh, I want some of those. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> This long and black like pepper. And yeah, anyway, <laughs> you will notice that I have very little respect for uh, propriety. Um, it's very colorful. I, I knew exactly what you meant. I know now what to look for. <laughs> it's it's very tasty. It's peeper longum. It's, it's easy to find. And uh, grains of paradise are also not, not particularly difficult to find. Yeah. Um, um, although they really need to be crushed before you use them. They're these little hard um, seeds that if you don't crush them, you're not going to get much paper out, a flavor out of them. So the third one I served was, I'm trying to remember. Uh, yeah, they, they must have all been good because nobody has said anything negative about them so far. Oh, that the third one I served was that one I was talking about, rosemary and lemon. It's a 1660 recipe, which I'm going to have to make that recipe again because the first time I made it, it ended up a little bit too sweet. And this time I tried to make it just a little bit less sweet and the flavors shifted completely. So I haven't quite figured out exactly. Shifted to what? I mean, it sounds like a nice combination. It's a wonderful combination. Uh, this time I made it the lemon... I didn't get the acid bite from the lemon that I was looking for. Oh, too rosemary. Not too rosemary, but the rosemary and the lemon were well balanced. Okay. 
Um, so who knows what happened? It's, you know, I think you have sometimes have to make a recipe at least a, you know, a half a dozen or a dozen times to really understand the, the factors that go into it. And well, Loris, it's the top of the hour. Oh, uh, are you I'm ready done. to jump in some questions? <laughs> sure. All um, right. Uh, so, so those of you that it's the first time, uh, the question is in the ask a question button, you type them in and I will read them to Laura. And, uh, if you've got to run, I really understand that. I know, you know, people only allocate maybe an hour for these. Uh, the main thing I would say is if you enjoyed this, please seriously consider buying or renewing your AHA membership and using that link. So you'll kind of know with your vote, um, Let's see. So somebody was at Henry Excelsior's asking, how do they know? Uh, that link should have a, like a long string on the end and it should say gourmet brewing in it. And so my understanding is from Matt Bowling that everything that's purchased with that link, they will know. Uh, if you're worried about it, I've got Matt's email address and you can mail him. <laughs> so, um, Back to the questions. Um, so we've got three so far. Get yours in. If you don't have a question, but you see one you really want asked first, and I see somebody has already voted for those, you can vote. So we will continue to uh, get Laura to answer these as long as they keep coming in. So Laura, the first question, which is the most popular, and that was from Michael. And Michael asks, what commercial meaderies are making the best traditional or ancient meads? That's an interesting question. Um, my experience of commercial meaderies is less wide than I would like it to be. The, the answer is, to a certain extent, most meter, meaderies that are making melomels and spiced meads are probably making something that has some pretty good historical antecedents. Because, again, the point I tried to make earlier is that these historical recipes show a variety that, that's, that's enormous. And the use of spices in particular was very prevalent. And the, that spice list is, for the most part, very similar to the spices we use today. You know, the most, the most common, you know, when we look at the top 20 ingredients of historical meads, the top five are ginger, clove, cinnamon, rosemary, and nutmeg. Four or five, four or five of those are spices, nutmeg, cinnamon, ginger, and cloves. Um, very typical meat ingredients. The, so are you saying I'm, almost all meads have ancient roots? Yes. So what, what would make a mead uh, not ancient? Maybe that's another way to ask the question. Like we've got this Viking blood, you know, that makes it sound so, very ancient. So uh, use, using ingredients that were not available to our, our mead makers of 300 years ago. Okay. And you're excluding nutrients. You're you're talking about Yeah, I'm excluding that. I'm talking about flavoring ingredients. Right. Uh things that are modern, like okay, good example, peanut butter and jelly mead, definitely not historic. Does definitely doesn't echo anything historically. Is there such a thing? Uh I see it talked about. <laughs> um that sounds what was the disgusting. One? And I'm sure I'm sure I'm getting it wrong. When I went to the uh Master me maker talk at home brew con. One of the ones we were served was it cucumber and pickle mead. Oh, was, now, now Michael Fairbrother had one of those at home brew con, it was phenomenal. Okay, no, it was, it was the, it was really, really well made. But the idea of cucumber and uh, you know, uh, pickling ingredients. Again, it doesn't echo anything we've seen historically. I see to the side here, someone brought up uh, Michael Acerglins. Those are not historical. However, whoa, 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 whoa. what is an Acerglin? Acerglin uh, made with maple syrup. However, there is an entire class of meads that appear in starting in about 1660 in England, um, a series of recipes mostly related that use birch sap 
as the water source. So it's birch sap and honey and usually spices and sometimes lemon. And those birch sap meads appear for the next couple hundred years in mostly in British sources. Did you say British? Your, your, your audio dropped out for just a moment. British, yes. Yes. Okay. Although there is, a, there is evidence that birch sap as a fermented drink goes back to the 10th century. I have never heard of uh, By one of the that. Arab travelers in the 10th century. I mean, do they get that the same way they do maple? And Yes, it's, it, it's actually collected exactly the same way maple stuff. You drill into the tree, you get the sap out when it starts running in March, and it's actually still pretty widely used in the Baltic countries as a early spring drink. And it is available. I've I've actually looked, and it see, looks like I I can get it uh, with a with an application of more money than I'd like. And I will I'll be doing that sometime soon because I really want to see what birch sap me tastes like. Yeah, I, I wonder what it tastes like. Period. I mean, just birch sap just doesn't have a whole lot of a <laughs> a stellar appeal from the sounds of it. Well, it, it's 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 like maple sap. It comes. It's actually a little less sugar than maple sap. I think it's about one percent sugar to start with, so that uh, with honey and get the the flavor of the honey added to it. Okay. Uh, yeah, and Michael says maybe a substitute for maple sap is the birch sap. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was a cool question. I like that one. Um, Next one, we're going to move into, all right, so none of them are voted up. So we're just going to take the one at the top, which I guess was the most recent. So yeah. James asks, how long is too long for a mead to sit on the yeast? <laughs> we do see racking as a very common activity in the historical meads. So it does seem that they would did not want it to sit on the yeast for a, a huge period. Um, and I think that's one of those, I think that's one of those larger brewing questions that I'll just defer because certainly there are those who are very much in favor of the surly aging as a way to add different kinds of flavors. And then of course you get the flavors from the autoly autolysis of, of the yeast. All right. Surly aging. I'm not familiar with that. Uh, it, literally what it says in, well, in French, sur lee, on the lees, aging on the lees. Rather than racking it off of the yeast okay. that settles, settles, you leave it on there for aging. So uh, we're talking years? I'm, I honestly, I'm not entirely sure. I'm, it's not, it's a fairly modern practice. Again, I follow the instructions that are in whatever recipe I'm doing. So there are there are gaps in my knowledge. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. I'll ask questions till it hurts sometimes. No, no it's, 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 it's the infinite. Truly, I have no shame in because I know a lot about a lot of things, but this is a huge universe of knowledge. Well, why don't we go to just your experience? So James is asking how long is too long? How long do you think is too long? I, I typically I typically don't see recipes that leave things on the lees for much more than a you know two a couple of months maybe three to six months at the most most of the recipes call for pulling it off after a period of months not a period of years um wow and no autolysis in six months you're probably getting some yeah but it's not enough to add a majority and this is and this is something that we probably could get into a long philosophical debate about. Remember, when we looked at those charts that showed 10 to 15 percent of historical recipes are plain meads. And all of these things we're talking about, side flavors from stressed yeast, flavor addition from autolysis, these sorts of things are all going to become less detectable yeah. the more flavor you have in the mead. Okay, so if you got black currants in that baby, you, you're you're, just, you're gonna be you're hard not going to notice a lot. If you have, <laughs> I I've I've seen some recipes that'll call for putting in forty cloves into two gallons and letting it sit for a month. And all I can think is, whoa, I'm not likely to be interested in making that one. Um, we used to say, 
wave a clove at it. Now you're done. Well, well, speaking of black currants, my very first meat ever was served to me by Brad Smith uh, and Gordon.